Okay, uh, so this was a suggestion through a donation. Okay, uh, Tom McDonald's uh, famous interview about his life before fame, Billboard, Eminem, and more. Yes. Um, yeah, dude, so let's get it. Uh, if you're new here, please like and subscribe. Uh, the more you like this content, the more that I know you want to see more of this specific content. Um, I will try not to make this video so long, okay, because it's already 40 minutes. So by me adding my content to it, it's going to be something like an hour. And I don't really want it to be an hour, <laughs> obviously, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, dude, let's, uh, let's do it. Let's check it out. I drank like it was my job for like 10 years. I had partying every day and blah, blah, blah. I had a mental breakdown. Hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, it's Michael McCrudden. I am still on this channel, not as regularly as I used to be, but I've been reading all your comments. You guys seem to love Marlon. You love Azalea. You love Clyde. There's Rick. There's like Kara. There's a lot of people working here. So thanks for everyone tuning in as you do. Now today's uh, a no brainer. We got Tom McDonald. This video blew up. This guy has got one of the most loyal and consistent fan bases that I've ever encountered doing this show. Literally, literally, all right? But uh, there's a lot of naysayers out there. There's a lot of people that, you know, kind of thrown shade his way. It's a fantastic story. I mean, this guy, I don't know. He's kind of one of a kind. So uh, I'm excited to talk to him. You guys also sent in some questions. So I'll be asking him what you guys want to know. And uh, we're gonna be doing more interviews. That's something that I'll be doing more moving forward. I think we got Pooh Shiesty also scheduled. Marlon's gonna take over that one. But uh, we're reaching out to everyone because this channel has come a long way and it's time to connect. Plus COVID's been, you know, kind of isolating. So it's nice to make friends. Anyway, I did all that without a script. Uh, I did pretty good. Let's get into the Ed, end. hold on people. I will try to skip it as soon as I can. All right, let's interview. go. All right, so we got Tom McDonald here. Now this guy is coming off a huge win. What happened like yesterday? You were on Billboard with what? Four number ones? Four number ones, dude. How does that even happen, bro? Like your whole life came together at once, culminated in this big win. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, dude. Like, um, so it had been at the beginning of the year, it had been like a month since I'd released anything. Uh, I had sort of, my girlfriend had planned on releasing an album and some videos, so I gave her the month to sort of uh, just do her thing. I didn't want to overshadow what she was doing. And then I had a video planned for the 20th, uh, which was like a super, believe it or not, Fake Woke was the, uh, was the lesser of the quote unquote controversial songs that I had ready to start the year off. Um, and then, so I had a video slated for the 20th and then the election uh, and the events surrounding that in America, like um, stuff happened, which completely sort of uh, took my song out of context. So I canceled that video and I was scrambling to uh, put something else together. Um, Cause like I said, it had been four weeks and I needed something new. Um, and I put together Fake Woke and put that out and it went just super viral and I ended up on Fox News and on all these different interviews and media platforms and that I, I actually still need to go actually see um, his interview on Fox. Uh, I will though. I'll check it out. Put together Fake Woke and put that out and it went just super viral and I ended up on Fox News and on all these different interviews and media platforms and that just sort of thrust that video into a new echelon and um, the streams and downloads combined with the views in a condensed period of time just thrust it to the top of the billboard charts in four different categories so it's four number ones um, put me at the top number one spot on the emerging artist chart it also charted like in the top 100 and the top, the hot 100 uh, hip hop R&B songs. And um, it was just like one of those things, man. We had, we had a, we had a powder keg and a spark happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a whole bunch of things culminated at once. But this is like your first rodeo, right? Like I went back, this is, uh, this is like 10 years in the making. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been, I've been <laughs> He's been grinding. Grinding it out for a long time, man. And it just, it seems like in the last, you know, three years, especially like considerable success. But in the, in the last year and a half, um, it's been a really wild ride. So I actually had found out, I, I, I'm still really new to this whole like 
uh, like the, your famous thing. So I hadn't even been paying attention to the Billboard charts. And then after we hit number one, um, I actually went in and did some digging and found out that I've had like four or five singles chart and in the top five in like a lot of different categories, which was like, and I just found out yesterday that that, that <laughs> even happened. Um, so it's weird. I like got on the phone yesterday with Billboard and now I got 10 plaques coming to the house for song, songs I didn't even know charted. <laughs> Congratulations. So you're an independent artist. There's no label. There's no manager. There's no publicist. A lot of people are going to be asking, how the hell did you do this? Like, there's no short answer, obviously. His fan base, bro. Trust me. It's his fan base. Obviously, but Man, uh, I'm not even fully aware of, like, how this happened. It was just, like, a really sickening work ethic and consistency that lasted an extended period of time. And um, it was weird. Like, three years ago, um... I literally had no views on anything and no fan base and had very little traction. Um, I was living in like a rundown shack in South Central with my girlfriend. And um, essentially what happened was we didn't have money for food. We didn't have money for rent. We didn't have anything. Um, and I had half a cigarette left in this cigarette pack. And I went out and sat on the front step and over that half cigarette wrote this song called Dear Rappers. And Dude, Dear Rappers, still to today, I think is probably his best song. Um, like I said, I'm, um, on my, my previous video that I did for him, um, without a doubt, I'm going to be working on a top 10 video for him. And Dear Rappers is definitely going to be number one. I'm just going to tell you this right now. Dear Rappers is number one, all right? <laughs> I walked in the house after writing it and told my girlfriend, hey, I think, I think I just did the one that's going to change everything. We need to shoot this video right now. And my girlfriend is a big part of this operation. She's a music video director and, and shoots music videos and blah, 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 blah. So we ended up shooting the video that day. And when it was done... I called my friend Brandon and I said, dude, I think I just wrote the song that's gonna change my life. I sent it to him, he agreed. I said, dude, I need $250 so I can run ads on this song because I'm flat broke, I have no money. Um, he sent me 250 bucks. I called another friend of mine uh, in, in, in Canada. I said, dude, I need $150, I'll pay you back, I promise. He gave me 150 bucks. I called my younger sister. I borrowed three hundred dollars from her. I found a guy on Facebook who said he was an investor. I went for a meeting with him, and I borrowed four hundred bucks from him. And I took all of this money that I had bummed off of my two friends, my sister, and this stranger, which I think amounted to about eleven hundred dollars. I dropped the video on Facebook, put that eleven hundred dollars behind a Facebook ad for the video, and less than twenty-four hours, it had a million views, and literally, like everything changed. And I've just been holding on tight since then, just <laughs> trying to keep up with the machine. That's what we call humble right here, people. That is a beautiful respect, story. Respect, respect. Rock bottom, essentially, and all in. Yeah, <laughs> bet it all on red, man. Sometimes you got to do it. Yep. I love it. That's I literally what I did with this channel, dude, by the way, if you guys didn't know. <laughs> literally. Let's get it. All right, so we're in Canada here. I know you're a Canadian. We're a little far removed from everything that's going on in America. We're talking pandemic. We're talking Capitol Hill. You guys are in Los Angeles. There was rioting there. Can you just tell me like what's been going on in your world during like the last few months? <laughs> what was happening was a lot of people who were speaking about it online were all of a sudden disappearing. Their profiles and they're being deplatformed and um, they're just sort of being like a race from the internet. So for that reason alone, like I've worked like you had mentioned, like this has been a 10 year, a 10 year overnight success. So, um, and that meant way too much to me to put in jeopardy for something like that. So I sort of like stayed away from it and didn't say anything about it. But obviously that was in DC, which is, you know, a long way from here, but We've, man, like, I was living uh, really close to Melrose when the initial riots were going on um, <clears throat> and the pandemic started and uh, George Floyd was uh, killed by the police. So 
Like, there was concussion grenades going off in front of my house. There was two police cars on fire on my street. There was people hiding in my yard with arms full of Nike boxes that they looted from, from Melrose. Like, um, so I've been in the thick of it. Like, uh, Nova and I, like when this stuff was happening initially and the pandemic had started and there's all these, uh, riots going on, like, and we had a curfew in place. Like, I remember one night, the night that Melrose was burning, I was literally standing in my living room, like, with my girlfriend, holding a machete, just, like, waiting for somebody to breach the house. Like, it was, like, it was terrifying, dude. Um, and then it was only a couple days after that, we had curfews in effect, and I remember my phone buzzing, and it said, like, resident of, like, this area, like, you have a curfew, 4.30 p.m., and it was like four o'clock p.m. at the time, and I said to Nova, um, "We need food. We need um, cigarettes. We need deodorant. There was like a few things we needed, and it's, it was stuff that couldn't wait the night. So I said, "I'm going to the store to get this stuff, um, curfew or not." And Nova said, "Well, I'll go with you, but I have asthma. I can't run. So if you get into trouble, like you're gonna have to like carry me essentially." So we ventured out and go to the first store and it's closed. Second store closed, third store closed. We reached the fourth store, finally find one that's open. But by the time we reach that fourth store, we're about 40 minute walk from our house at this point. Um, I get all the stuff I need and it is a ghost town on the streets. Like Nova and I are the only two people as far as you can see in any direction. So I'm like freaking out a little bit because I'm like, all we need is a cop to drive by. I don't know how seriously they're enforcing this. If a helicopter sees us, are they gonna call it in? Like, what's the deal? So we start walking home with our groceries and we get into the subdivision and this lady pulls up next to us, like a hundred miles an hour, rolls down her window. She's like, where are you guys going? And we're like, uh, we're going home. And she's like, okay, well go a different way because the military is coming up this street right now. Um, Damn dude. And there's only one way for us to get home and it's down that street. Damn. So I said to Nova, like, can we just stop for a second and, and just to congratulate Tom on his amazing storytelling abil abilities. <laughs> like I'm, I'm fully involved in this story right now, dude. We're going to have to run. And if your asthma is too bad, I'll carry you. And we literally took 20 steps, turned the corner. And there is like an armored vehicle, like a tank with a soldier hanging off the side of it, holding a machine gun. And there's just like a bunch of vehicles, military vehicles following them. So we had to deke out into an alleyway and hide behind garbage cans and eventually made it home. But like, damn, dude, that's just a couple examples Like we have been in the thick of the um, volatile political climate in America for the last nine months. It's not the pandemic that's gonna get you. Your your actual lives are at risk. My yeah, God. right. I want to talk about Nova. I, I can't I can't understand how you guys like. It looks like the last two tracks just dropped within a week, and there's so much production. You gotta make the song. You gotta make the video. You gotta promote this stuff. Get it out to everyone. Then hit Billboard. I just don't like. How do you? Can you tell me like how you streamlined this whole process? Literally, like what happened was. Um... Like I said, I had that original song and video slated for the 20th. And then with the Capitol Hill stuff that happened, I had to pivot and go a different direction. And there was multiple things that I was taking into account. A, the political climate, so I couldn't directly, uh, I mean, Trump got banned off Twitter for quote unquote, inciting violence. I read those tweets I personally didn't feel like that was the case. I could, I could definitely understand how somebody might purposefully distort the language in those tweets to serve their narrative of crossing community guidelines. So seeing how that was done, I was being very careful. What can I say? How, how will it be taken out of context? How will this be used to, um, um, you know, how will it be used to deplatform me? How can they take what I'm saying 
distort it to have it breach their 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 uh, terms of service and then remove me. So exactly. that was on my mind. People being deplatformed was on my mind. The things going on in the world were on my mind. So it was a really it was a really dicey period to be writing songs of the nature that I write. So essentially, like what happened was. Over the course of like three or four days, I wrote like six songs, and it seemed like they were either too controversial or、uh, weren't powerful enough, or there was I wanted it to be the perfect thing for the times. So, out of the five times or a song, five songs rather that I wrote,、uh, "Fake Woke and Cancelled" were two of those songs, and I just thought, okay, I'm gonna go with "Fake Woke." And we'll shoot the video for that, which we did. And I'm anticipating some substantial backlash to this song, and、mm-hmm. the possibility of being de- like from listening to the song "Fake Woke."、Um, I get it; it was powerful, yes, but I don't think that there was anything specifically in that song that would like, like affect his platform at, at the very least. Um, so I think he was pretty, pretty much good there, dude. He platformed or removed off of social media. It, it's a real possibility. So to sort of prepare for that, I said, okay, we'll go with canceled second. So in the event that I get removed, canceled will be will be even more relevant. Yeah.、Um, Smart. So I didn't get deplatformed, but I got quote unquote. Cancelled by the internet mob, so it was just a little bit of foresight, you know. I wrote the five songs, trying to figure out what I was going to do next, and two of them just seemed to pair together really well, and that's what we did. I, I didn't see it. Like, I actually got, I got off Twitter myself because I just found it way too toxic of a platform. But I, I, like, I was looking up headlines. I saw some people said you called out Eminem. I didn't really see it that way. No, he、uh, didn't. You did just pass him on. On a billboard, right? And that was like a huge moment for you. So I saw where you were you were playing with, like you know, it's, you gave him a shout out, and you're just it, it was all relevant what you were saying. What um what are they what were they coming at you for, or like where's this angry mob coming from? Um, <clears throat> well, it's a couple different places. Like there is just like a culture on the internet, especially on Twitter, and I agree that Twitter is the most toxic platform. It is. It's undeniable. It's crazy.、Um, What's interesting is that I do have a Twitter.、Um, I'm actually attempting to. I guess I'll only be using Twitter for the sole purpose of letting people know when I will be live streaming because that is coming to the channel really soon.、Uh, so definitely go follow my Twitter.、Um, uh, it's at Mr. L Boyd.、Um, but yeah, I've so I've never actually involved myself in the culture of Twitter, so I don't know how toxic it really is to. But every but the way everyone speaks about it is it's probably poison. But、uh, as I said, my usages for it will only be basically telling people when I will be going,、uh, you know, live. Basically, All right? Let's get it. So the internet mobs kind of came from two places. There's the whole cancel culture thing where it's like anything that they don't agree with or. These days, man, like you can't talk about anything without people throwing a label. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're anti-feminism. You're this. You're that. And it's just like these are people that, that like either a don't want to have the conversation、exactly. or b don't know enough about the conversation to have it. So instead of、exactly. like having some form of dialogue, they just like hurl insults and labels and stuff. So those people, anytime that something hits the internet, whether it's a song or a music video or a movie or a skit or comedy, whatever it is, if they don't like it, if it doesn't seem to align itself with their personal ideologies, they get all their little internet friends to to cancel you. And essentially, like all that is, is a bunch of people saying, "You're canceled. We're not going to listen to you anymore." And like what people don't realize <laughs> is like. The best. They weren't listening in the first place. I'll be honest.、Um, if the people who are trying to cancel him, right,、um, are saying you're canceled, you're canceled, I'm never going to listen to you again, like, right? Be fully aware they weren't listening in the first place. Okay, so their lack of a view will do nothing but change.、Uh, will will do nothing for him in, in a sense, basically.、Um, it'll also do nothing against him. Right, and what will happen is then the people who actually listen to him now will then tell all of their friends to 
listen to him exclusively, right? So now all of his views will shoot up once you once you try to cancel uh, specifically someone like Tom, right? So uh, cancel Tom. <laughs> Let's get it. And essentially, like, all that is is a bunch of people saying, you're canceled. We're not going to listen to you anymore. And, like, what people don't realize is, like, the best way to handle that when somebody says, hey, you're canceled. The only way to handle it is to say, hey, no, I'm not. Oh. Like, and, and, that, and that's it. And that's how you deal with it. So that was one group of people. And the other group of people is the aforementioned stands, which are uh, Eminem fans. And like, I don't, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine as far as those guys go. I think that Eminem is such a prolific character in hip hop um, and rightfully so, but his fan base is just so blinded by fandom. I've owned every album that guy ever put out with the exception of like whatever the last few years. But when I was a kid, that was like my go-to. That was what inspired, I wouldn't be here right now without Eminem. So, but that doesn't, just because, you know, Eminem inspired me and Eminem's the greatest of all time does not make him immune to criticism. And like, that's what, that's how his fans feel. So just by um, mentioning his name. Dude, no one is immune to criticism. If you feel as if someone who you like a lot is immune to criticism, then you probably don't know the person because generally if someone has fame or they're in the limelight, they generally appreciate honest criticism. They wouldn't have gotten where they were without constructively being criticized, right? So, uh, yeah, dude. Name in the song, it just started a whirlwind of a whirlwind of shit. So th th those were the two groups that were being loud on the internet, both for different reasons. But uh, it, so it wasn't like a, a, a conglomerative effort. It was two different groups mad for different things, but. It was really loud on the internet for a few days, that's for sure. I just had a bit of a light bulb moment. Like I was a huge Eminem fan myself growing up and like we witnessed him and Marilyn, they were just villainized by mainstream media. Now you're having your big blow up and it's so, it's such telling of the times that now the people, it's like a mass army of fans or stands. It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the unheard people, the, the fans online, as opposed to the media conglomerates coming after you. Yeah, it's really bizarre, man. Like, uh... It, it, it's yeah it seems like maybe this is just not accurate but it kind of is an interesting observation to think that back when sort of Eminem was in his prime or even like you know <clears throat> slightly earlier than that with like NWA and stuff like that like it seemed like those presences were under attack from the actual media um, for the content of their songs and now, like, it's just bizarre. To, and, and they were being championed by the people and attacked by mainstream media. And it's just bizarre to think that I was on the news last week talking about my song being championed by the media and attacked by the people. It's just like a really weird uh, juxtaposition, you know? Exactly my point. That is amazing. It's crazy. It's, it's mind boggling. And there's so many things now for an artist or a public figure to deal with simultaneously. But I love how you you seem to be reactive, you know, with your your dropping singles instead of albums, and you're able to almost morph your 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 story as you go. Yeah, um, I was a pro wrestler for like a long time before. Wait a second. All right, dudes. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and split this into two parts. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, dudes, it's just to make it not so crazy and monotonous, all right? Um, I'll put both parts up at the same time, though. It's just to make it so we have some breathing room. You know what I'm saying? All right, and um, okay, so uh, yeah, dudes, I'll catch you in part two.